Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, good people around the world. This is the Black Hat Chat, collaboration between myself, Lee Johnson, and Reverend Kai. And I'm just going to put the screen over here because watching two at the same time is very distracting. <laughs> right, so this is just two, two riches that get together every Friday and talk about crafting in the modern age. And at the moment, we are talk, well, studying and discussing the Cochrane Letters to Joseph Wilson. And this is a study chat. Um, format may, may be a little bit different to what a lot of people are used to. Uh, we do go through, this, through the letters and pick them to pieces and discuss whatever we can figure out from the letters and obviously being as we ramble off into different things as well. Right. Yeah. I think one of the reasons I enjoy reading like this is context. You know, we talk mm. so often about context is so important. And while Lee and I may pick out certain bits to talk about, it's not the same if we didn't have the context of the entire letter. You know, so, and we'd love for all of you who are able to make the lives to let us know what you think. and what you would pick out or what you decided to go look up and reference. So mm. this is our, our Friday study group kind of thing. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> yeah. With hot chocolate and tea, I assume. Yeah. <clears throat> tea. Mm. Gotta have tea. <laughs> Doesn't taste good. I did good. actually forget to. <laughs> I know. Well, my hot chocolate does so there. That's good. <laughs> I actually forgot to check who won the um, votes on the um, what's on the telly this this month. Oh, I think it was Pan's Labyrinth. <clears throat> so that'll go up tomorrow. And uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's Pan. It was Pan's Labyrinth last time I checked, so it's way ahead. That was a good review as well. Mm -hmm. All right then, let us begin on the fifth letter. We are doing fifth letter from Robert Cochran to Joe Wilson, dated 5th of April, 1966. Dear Joseph, many thanks for your letter, which I enjoyed reading. I find your interpretation of the five queen lines of Amagen, Amagen of great interest, since it shows you are well on the road. Basically, they follow the pentagram. That is life, love, maternity, wisdom, death. Obviously, since the interpretation of the faith is deeply personal, we differ somewhat in our approaches, but basically we seem to be traveling in the same direction. The line, I am a spear, refers to the cauldron mystery, the original Holy Grail, in the sense that the Grail, or divine, divine inspiration, was acti activated originally by a priest bearing a spear, who, like Sir Gawain, performed the sacred marriage by thrusting the spear into the cauldron. Symbolically, he was taking the principle of life made of ash and steel. Ash, the mother tree, earth, steel or iron, the metal of Kronos, Wayland, the god of time, physical life. And so continuing life by bringing down the principle of movement to earth, literally drawing down the moon. In thrusting the spear, the priest performed an act of love, thus bringing us to the next point of the ritual, I am a salmon. Shall I do the whole paragraph, or should we discuss that one first? Uh, let's keep going. Okay. <clears throat> ritually, ritually, as you will find by reference to the Arthurian legends, he then withdrew the spear and cast drops of blood that fell from its tip onto the earth and surrounded and surrounding congregation. Sorry, I've got bugs on my neck. Um, this action was based upon observation of the actual mating habits of, of the salmon, the fish who anciently represented fertility and wisdom. These are records of trout or salmon, sorry, there are records of trout or salmon being used for div divination as late as the 16th century. The salmon comes in from the sea to spawn and die, but in dying, the male salmon casts his sperm over the eggs, so the sequence of love and death is built up which idea is confirmed by Grion's further poem, uh, Pridwi Anwin, when he writes, where the evening star and the dark of night meet together, 
The ritual at this point is like Catholic sacrament. The host has been raised and trans, trans try that again. Transubstantiated. In other words, spirit and matter have been brought together in the action of the ritual, as spirit and matter may be considered as the female spirit and the spear as phallic, in the sense that the goat god represents time or physical life. The ritual becomes that of union or love. And hello, Lady Capera. Oh. Doing well. <clears throat> All right, this whole letter is packed with uh, information and stuff, so it might take a while to get through this one. All right, so let's start with I am a spear. Cauldron mystery is a holy grail. Um, I was reading, I'm, I'm reading uh, William Gray at the moment, uh, Kabbalistic Concepts, and I, I actually noticed in there he talks about um, Grail Castle, which in his reference seems to be the Rose Castle that we talk a lot about in traditional witchcraft. Um, moving over that, the western boundary into the Rose Castle, or the Grail Castle as he calls it. Mm -hmm. um, and that really kind of in my mind, fits in with the cauldron as well, with the motion. You know, it's doing, taking the whole cycle of life and death uh, and run the space. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> and we've also got the mention of the pentagram, which is life, love, maternity, wisdom, death, which is the whole cycle of life as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And death. I am the salmon. Yeah, the the way the salmon becomes a symbol for fertility and death that he describes here is rather odd. Mm. I guess if, you know, you live where salmon are <clears throat> a staple food and you're regularly hunting them and aware of their life cycles, that might yeah. come out of that. And um, there is the aspect of the spear. The spear pops up a lot. I mean, he often refers to um, overlaps with Christianity as well. So we've got the mm -hmm. spear uh, piercing the side of Christ with, with compassion. Uh, we've also got the spear that pierces the side of um, Othin. <coughs> um, although it doesn't mention it here. Although Wayland's mentioned. Yeah, but... Wayland doesn't have anything to do with Odin or Christ. No. But there is mention of uh, steel or iron, metal of Kronos, Wayland. Yeah, I think that's just linking, you know, Wayland the Smith with uh, metalworking. And mm. although iron is not traditionally the metal of Kronos, iron belongs to Mars. But um, for non-astrological paths, then I could see how it would just be metal. It goes with Kronos because of the association with death and weaponry and that sort of thing. The boundaries of time. I don't know. Mm -hmm. The thrusting a spear into the cauldron and then being like, ooh, mystery, Hieros Gamos. I... It's so done. Everybody knows how that works, right? Um, it's not no. really a mystery. It's not really um, a big mystery at all because there's no. nothing mystical going on. It's very it's esoteric. Kind of, it's not quite with the great writer as well and the thrusting of the athame into the uh, chalice. Yeah, same thing. Yeah. And, I mean, it's... It's only a mystery if it's like in some kind of Christian context where, oh, that's what it means. You figure out when you're 15, you know, mm. it's not, I don't know. There are more um, actual esoteric ideas about fertility and maternity and love and, you know, he just immediately equates all of the um, fertilizing, the impregnation with love, and that's not 
really the mm. way it goes. Um, it's not the mystery that's found in nature. It's not my understanding of the mystery through traditional witchcraft or through other witchcraft paths. Um, love is something else. Love is not tied up with fertility in that way in a de facto relationship. No, I think he might be referring back to his uh, definition of the pentagram though, because he has maternity in there. Well, he says, in thrusting the spear, the priest performed an act of love. Mm. Yeah. Thus bringing us to the next point in the ritual. I am a salmon, which he doesn't talk. Maybe he talks about maternity, but his focus of, is upon the dying male salmon. And so the sequence of love and death is built up, which in the um, pentagram are not connected in sequence, are they? Life, life, love, maternity, wisdom, death. So they would have a connection, a line. But um, he then makes that connection that skips part of the cycle either going backwards or forwards. Yeah. And then he speaks about uh, where the evening star and the dark of the night meet together. Is that referring to Venus? Mm. I would whenever think I so. Whenever I see evening star and dark of night, it's in Venus in the West. Yeah, I, I've read Praetorian one long ago, but um, I don't. I don't remember it enough. I'm not into Welsh cosmology. It never tripped mm. my trigger and and I never do dove deeply into it. So, but this, this comes off as, off as very Christian influenced. Man, cannot get my throat to behave today. Mm. I think a lot of this stuff is Christian influenced. Yeah. And I mean, like, I don't know, the spe you said the spear that pierced the side of Christ with compassion. Is that part of the Christian mystery that that was compassionate? Yeah, because you've been up there suffering for so long that the um, the Roman uh, was it warrior god, I don't know what they call them, <coughs> um, decided to pierce his side out of compassion to so it would kill him. But sticking someone in the lung doesn't kill them quickly. Slicing their throat kills them quickly. It just makes more suffering. I think it was suffering. just too far away. I don't know. Yeah. That's the ideology anyway. That doesn't make yeah. any sense. I mean, mm. crucifixion is horrible, horrible torture. Yeah. Horrible torture. And then to... Because he bled out for a while, didn't he? They didn't even pierce his lung. They just, like, cut him under the ribs. I don't know. It's so, actually depicted. What was that series that I watched recently? Oh, bloody hell. Put it on the name. It's all based on Rome invading um, uh, England, the British Isles and stuff. Hmm. Uh, I can't remember. But they actually depicted in there. Um, they have a memory when the commander uh, instructs the guard to go and pierce Christ's side because he'd been up on the crucifix for too long and he was suffering. I thought that so was a it was point. an act of compassion, apparently. Yeah. I thought that was the point of crucifixion is torture and suffering in a public manner. And wasn't he like crucified with a whole bunch of people? Mm. So did they only stab him or were they like poking everybody to let the gases out? No, he'd been up there too long. So he was becoming a martyr to the people. Oh, because he didn't die fast enough. Mm. I don't know. Never really got into Christian mythology either. Um, doesn't make a lot of sense to me, so. Mm. All right, let's go over to the chat quick. Um, Lady Pro said, is that what they call it, an act of love? <laughs> it was the 60s with men. Patriarchy was still reigning, so yeah, probably... Um, Candace asked, isn't the reference to the wedding, which is where the idea of love comes through? Uh, 
Hang on. Maybe I missed something in here. Where was the wedding? Which wedding are we referring to? Let me carry on with the comments on Candace. Historically, when this was written, the notion of marrying for love would be the ultimate romantic gesture. Yeah. True. In the 60s? Oh. Or do you mean when uh, Pro Dewey on one was written? No, they're not talking about marriage there. Are they? No. No, sorry. I don't think so. Getting things mixed up there. Um, and also, it was the most subtle way the god could do it without being outright outspoken. You know, stabbing um, Jesus is three in the side. Yolandi also said, uh, we were taught they stabbed Jesus with a spear to check if he is still alive or dead. Oh, okay. That, that makes sense. Candace said, uh, it is usually to be to check life and death. There we go. Um, however, it is noted in the Bible that this case was an act of compassion. Uh, Jesus, Jesus died with two other men who died long before him. The spear in the cauldron. I, do all the Bibles say that? All the versions of the Bible say that it was an act of compassion? Or is that just like some sex? I don't know. I'm not sure. It just strikes me as odd. I know it is a common uh, interpretation. So anyway, we're not going to get into Jesus and too much of that here because we're, we're trying to decipher the traditional witchcraft stuff, I think. The spear in the cauldron. The original hologram, the sense of grail divine inspiration was activated. Whoops. Originally by priest some... bearing a spear. Oh, who like Sir Gawain performed the sacred marriage? I don't read that as a wedding. The sacred marriage is uh, just a poetic way of saying penetration. Is that? Yeah, I would have thought sacred marriage would refer more to the, the union of um, yourself and your higher self or yourself and your fetch mate or yourself and your holy guardian angel or divinity or whatever it is. That's knowledge and conversation of the holy guardian angel. Which is not the same mm. as Hyrus Gamos. Oh, okay. Hyrus Gamos. Or the sacred marriage. Mm. So that's just. They're not the same. Million and one ways to, <laughs> to interpret something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it all comes down to. Yes. Well, um... and a lot of this um, is differences between traditions how words are used, uh, where they fall, what they mean, that sort of thing. So I think we're coming up against that also. Mm. Um, Sorry, I think I've got mozzies here tonight. They are attacking my neck instead of my ankles. Okay, should we go on to the next one? Um, Yolandi says, only some sex, since I asked if all sex mm -hmm. believe it. And Candace says, I can only speak for the Catholic Bible. I didn't know there was a separate Bible for Catholics. I, I mean, the Catholic Bible actually had uh, Apocrypha for in for a long time after the Christians took it out. Uh, I believe it eventually got taken out, but it was still present. I've read the, the Latin one before the first English translation. Mm. But I know the Catholic Church decided to move over to the English translation eventually. I remember you've also got like the King James version and you've got this version and that version and all the kings that decided to alter things. I've never really um, understood the King James version. Comparing it to most of the other versions of the Bible I've read, like in Greek and in Latin, there's just made up shit in it that <laughs> isn't there in the other versions. It's just like mm. random fan fiction. I don't know, it's weird. Yeah. I don't know where the stuff comes from that's in the King's James Version. And uh, the 
isn't that the version that has all the thee thou doth stuff in it the fake old english that's not even really like middle english i think it is i actually can't remember i shouldn't i shouldn't talk about things i don't know because i think there's also the new james king the new jack king james version i can't remember mm, yeah can't but there's up. a there's a lot of versions and a lot of translations and a lot of this goes in and this comes out and we don't like this bit and we'll put this bit in here and let's edit that bit and change the mm. numbers around and mm. you'd think mm -hmm. for a, a heavily book focused religion there'd be a consistent book mm. but uh it's not you just change the book every time anyways anyways mm. no when I, when I was in the church one of my biggest questions was why did they take the apocrypha out and the answer i got was that there were not enough there weren't any prophecies in it so it mm. wasn't worth keeping in um and i then asked the question but isn't it a sin to alter the bible um that then became very confusing for everybody oops uh, so i didn't really get an answer i thought i thought the baseline for all christians was that they were sinners anyways so they could just do whatever they wanted isn't that no you start you start out in, out in sin and you have to get rid of that something to that effect oh i thought they were just they started out in sin and so they were always sinners so that was the reason they could change the bible and commit adultery and greed and all all that no, sort of thing you could do you could do that from monday to saturday just not on sundays one on day sundays. a week not allowed all right now, this and is it, this is getting <laughs> We're going to get into Christian bashing soon. So. Yeah, yeah, I, I find Christianity very confusing. <laughs> All right, back over to the comments because they're rolling in. Um, Richard said, Lee, get some lavender or lemongrass plants. They keep the mosquitoes away. Uh, they actually usually attack my ankles, which, why, which is why I have a fan by my feet. Um, tonight, they just, my neck's getting itchy. Uh, or burn coffee. I don't want to burn coffee. That's I've... a sin. <laughs> drink coffee. As we just talked about sins, there's the true <laughs> sin, burning coffee. I've never heard to yes. burn coffee, my mosquitoes. I'll have to try that this summer when mm. we get into mosquito season. I'm definitely not burning coffee. I'd rather them bite me. I'll just drink the coffee. I got this. If I drink, if I drink a lot, maybe the mosquitoes won't bite me. Bite me. I thought that was bananas supposed to eat a lot of bananas, bananas. <laughs> not burning bananas potassium. you're supposed to eat a lot of bananas to keep the mosquitoes away okay all right now i have this <laughs> this whole jar of coffee i found uh cleaning out my pantry and you know mm -hmm. it had been pushed to the back and i uh smelled it and i wasn't i was like mm, i don't know not very great and uh then i you know brewed a little cup of it and i was like Meh. so it's sitting off in the corner of find another use for this coffee because <laughs> well, go. nobody's gonna drink it gonna... so yeah. yeah that dinged a little bell gonna burn coffee mm -hmm. probably smell terrible drive me away with the the mosquitoes that's usually what i find for most of those mosquito remedies <laughs> <laughs> anyways anyways <laughs> All right, continuing on this side, um, Candace hit fan fiction. I love it. Um, <clears throat> it is a fascinating history. Mm. <clears throat> Excuse me. It is a fascinating history. Um, it's fascinating to see how it was also altered. Um, lady Capera said, uh, neighbor lady was going off about the resurrection, dead people popping up from their coffins. I'm like, and you people think I'm weird. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's definitely one that I really don't get, the zombie resurrection. Especially with the you mm. gotta face them a certain way, keep the body intact, because you know, when the zombies stand up, they can't turn around. They just mer walk off. I, I don't know. It's so mm. strange. It's so strange. It may have to have to do some have something to do with mosquitoes as well. <laughs> no, no, we won't. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, mosqu mosquitoes in the grave create zombies because they can't stay in the grave any longer. That's what they're doing with all that blood. <laughs> they're not just reproducing. They're not, you know, carrying yeah, on the genetic the line of, of mosquitoes. They are God's sacred plan to complete the resurrection. That's uh, why GMOs are bad. No, I don't know. This is not a conspiracy show. 
Um, can, can just said, if you ever want to hear about it, uh, I don't mind doing tell. Oh, there we go. Hang on, maybe I can't read. If you ever want to hear about it, I don't mind telling you tomorrow. Okay, cool. I'm not sure what we're talking about anymore, so <laughs> you can tell me anyway. Um, Ethan S., how did you all get to Jesus from these letters? The spear. The, the spear. spear. That's that was, That's all it took. And then off we went yes. on ridiculousness. Yeah. Uh, I think, I think well, I haven't forgotten by now. <clears throat> um, oh, I'm looking, I'm getting more mosquito advice here. Thank you. Uh, Do a show about case, mosquitoes. <laughs> yeah. In that case, my son is safe. He eats bananas constantly. Lots of potassium. Mosquitoes don't like potassium, apparently. I'm allergic to bananas, and that was the reason my family always gave when I was younger, why the mosquitoes just absolutely ate me up. Uh, uh, but that's not it. it... <laughs> it's not. No. Um, mosquitoes not track people through carbon dioxide emissions. And mm. we don't, all bodies do not produce the same amount of carbon dioxide. We actually have quite a range. And people who are on the lower end don't produce enough that mosquitoes can generally find them until they're very close. But people who are on the higher end, we stand out like a bright light because we're producing so much carbon dioxide. Many, many mosquitoes in a larger area can pick up on it. And I'm at the very high end of the spectrum. So. I mean, you're, you're a tree. Yeah, yeah. Mm. We're all trees. Okay. Some of us are just better <laughs> at it. No. <laughs> More practice trees. <laughs> uh, Candace did say the resurrection story is quite common. It is. Um, I do think you find it in a lot of traditions. <clears throat> the we're talking about the the like the dead people getting up resurrection, not Jesus getting up resurrection, right? I assume because well, I would say, think that say not defending Christianity, so I assume Candace is referring to the Jesus resurrection. I was going to say, I thought the Jesus resurrection was what made Christianity Christianity. But the the dead people mm. resurrection, I want to say Armageddon, but that's not right. Um, it's a zombie, zombie apocalypse. Yeah, all, all the people have to be kept whole and their bodies preserved because Judgment Day, is that what it is? That's what it is in the Tarot when all the dead people get up and go to like join Jesus, and, uh, you know, the, the renewal of that whole thing because of that left behind novel in the nineties. Yeah, completely. There's a word for that. Yeah. Mm. Uh, what's the word everybody? <laughs> when, when people are beamed up into the sky and all their clothes are left behind and you get your pick of stereos on the block. I don't, what yeah. is the word for that? I don't remember what it is. Ascension? <laughs> I've gone blank. Yeah, it's a really common uh, one. <laughs> Candace is also, um. We all, um, and once we hear it, we're all going to be like, oh man. That's it. We spent too much yeah. of our. Rapture! Rapture! There Thank you, go. Lady Kibera. Thank you. That's the word. Thank you. Right. <laughs> and Richard got it too. <laughs> Collectively. We know things. Yay! And ascension, <laughs> rapture. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. For the rapture. Right. Yeah, you have to be like kept. Or does the rapture only take live people? Okay, I gotta stop. I'm sorry. I'm very curious about how Christianity actually works. Cause yeah. you carry on. I talk I'm to a go lot back of to the letter now. I talk to a lot of <laughs> priests at these interfaith meetings and I don't get a lot of answers. They just get angry and walk away. <laughs> I ask a lot of questions that I don't understand. <laughs> Anyways, <All right>. witchcraft. <laughs> witchcraft. Right, now I've got to try and find out where we left off. There we are. Okay. I am continuing now. Everybody calm down. <laughs> the contents of the cauldron are now transformed into the aqua vitae, the waters of life. Anciently, as Taliesin pointed out, the water of life was impregnated with one of the plants that brings that bring dreams such as fly agaric mushroom or the peyote cactus. However, I'm not suggesting that you do this. 
since they have extremely bad side effects and need care, caution and discipline to use efficiently. However, the sacred drink is now administered in the same fashion as the wine of the sacrament. Here we go again. Uh, now, how does this tie up with motherhood? The goddess feeds us as a mother does. So in this aspect, she is bountiful nature, Mother Earth feeding her children in the same way as any mother feeds the child. The priests of Isis carried a dish that was shaped like a female breast, and from the nipple fell a constant stream of water and milk, with perhaps wine mixed in. So then the, so then the congregation at the assembly are fed with the water of life, which, as you already appreciate, is inspiration or spirit brought to earth. This is, apart from the actual physical differences, exactly the same concept as the sacrament to be found in Christianity. Yep, as Candace said, the Jesus talk continues. So this, I don't know, this seems pretty straightforward. I mean, um, he kind of roundabout talks about the water of life is impregnated with one of the plants that brings dreams. And he picks out flyer gark, mushroom, and peyote cactus, although in northern Europe, and especially in the or Green Isles, it was usually mugwort, hence its common name, mugwort. Um, it's spring streams, it was brewed in a cauldron, it needs to be cooked softly for quite some time. You can't put absolute boiling water on mugwort and get a tea that produces dreams. It's a very low simmer. You get too high in temperature, you lose those components. And one of the um, things you can do with a well-made mugwort brew is get the sort of louche effect um, that you get with uh, absinthe and that sort of thing. And so that was part of the transforming it into the waters of life because you took what was kind of a clear liquid, a little bit cloudy because eh, it's tea, basically, and then you add the magic component and suddenly it turns to milk. It looks like a thin milk, it turns white, and therefore it has become imbued with the waters of life and is like the breast milk from the sacred mother. So I'm kind of surprised he didn't mention mugwort in here. Um, mm. I know you can do that with a peyote mixture too. I have never done it. I've just read about it that you can get that Lucia effect. I have no idea about fly agar mushroom because I have not seen that um, prepared in a liquid uh, preparation. I got words, lots of words. Um, it's all but, stuck on the tip of your tongue. But I know you can also use uh, psilocybin mushrooms in alcohol extractions, like in wine and that sort of mm. thing. I've read about that too. I'm not sure about the constituents of that and the effectiveness or, or the safety of any of this. Um, this is not, you know, not uh, recommended. I'm not a doctor. Don't do this shit. You're all on your own, <laughs> that sort of stuff. <laughs> but, as he says in the letter as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and run with it. Mugwort is usually one that is recommended early on because it's much harder to dose to toxicity. Usually by the mm -hmm. time you'd hit a toxic dose, you'd be vomiting, which is the nice failsafe your body has from killing you from drinking and eating bad things. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, the, do not, do not diminish the wonder that comes in the middle of ritual from the joys of chemistry that you can turn the waters of life into milk um, that you can uh, represent the numinous sacrament as something physical and visible tangible mm. so i'm just going to go over to the comments because there's one here which is very confusing Good looking honky said, Lee, friends, hi Peter North here, old adult film star. Great stream, thanks Peter North. I don't remember being an old adult film star myself. Um, oh, I thought Peter North was Nathan. the old adult film star, but I don't watch enough porn to actually know anybody's names. I should. Yeah, you'll, have to, you'll have to give a bit more context there. Yeah. 
And if you're into witchcraft, cool. Mm. I could I could become an old adult film star right now. Because not on I'm this old. stream. I will I will turn not it on off. This stream. <laughs> Well, I'll probably get booted off YouTube as well. Yeah, that's why I would turn it off so you didn't lose your YouTube channel. That would suck. <laughs> Don't do that, man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Lady Capera said censorship. censorship is not new. No, definitely not. Uh, all right, let's read comments from Candace here. Uh, no, it takes all the souls, but it depends on your belief of purgatory. Yeah, I think purgatory is mostly a, a Catholic construct. Um, this this part, oh, this part, this paragraph, was the most interesting to me. Makes me think of the old legend of the Fountain of Youth. Mm. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, because it speaks about the Aqua Vitae. Um, I, I still think that that whole concept of Florida water being called Florida water because fountain of youth is supposedly in florida it was just strange oh well i mean the fountain of youth is part misinterpretation and part justification for manifest destiny but i mean florida means full of flowers the flower flowery covered in flowers producing lots of flowers that kind of idea so it would make sense that the fountain of youth would be in the flowery place like we think of an abundant jungle that's just bursting mm. with life and vitality and that sort of thing i always had that relationship in mind not as a physical place called florida because that came much later but more as you know the the area where the fountain of life is 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 florido it's a, a vibrant flowering full of life place and the natural mm. spring that is there is where the waters of life literally flow forth from the earth and that's not necessarily one single location isolated away from everything else but when you find a spring that is in this lush and verdant place that is flowering and full of the perfumes of life and everything that is the evidence that it is aqua vitae that it is the sacred yeah. waters of life because it is nurturing and clean and obviously producing all of this abundant life around it and then later came the idea of finding it in the new world as part of manifest destiny and then limiting to a single thing you know instead of it's all over the place and then later naming the place florida at least okay. that's makes more sense now. my understanding of things mm -hmm. uh kind of said uh, would you not be able to reach the state by being silent reaching a nil state it's a different yeah. it's a different state is it? Entheo oh, is it the Entheogens is just getting you there. Mm. No. Entheogens and, and do not all lead to the same doors. Different different mm. plants go different places. Many of them go to meet plant spirits, and I wouldn't see them as uh, quiet states. Uh, maybe, perhaps, like Belladonna or something could be a quiet state but um most most entheogens are uh, fairly active states where um you as an individual consciousness are not in control not necessarily there uh, but nil states the the inward silence there's a lot of control involved and the individual consciousness is very much present through that process. It does not leave. Um, eventually you can have dissolution points within all of those experiences, but they are, um, I wouldn't even call them the same kind of dissolution. They're different doorways that lead to different places and different experiences. Mm, and I suppose the different plants because they come with the different spirits as well. You, um, 
you're interacting with those different spirits. I mean, I know um, Castaneda speaks a lot about peyote. Um, yeah. As an escalito. I, um, and that's, that's actually a teacher. Well, entheogens are spirits. They are partners in the work. They are mm -hmm. guides. They are teachers. They are mentors. And um, in that nil state, you are alone. You are not there with mm -hmm. a guide or a teacher or a mentor or anything. And I mean, some some of the entheogenic spirits teach through what we would think of as teaching and guiding and imparting information and some of them do things like disassemble you and put you back together with extra parts that's the way they teach you know and some of them show you what death is like and some of them do other things they're all different spirits with their own personalities their own agendas probably their own goals and their own methods um kind of said chemistry alchemy all the same you'll disagree with that won't you yeah alchemy has a lot more to it than chemistry these days i mean alchemy is the ancient birthplace of chemistry sure but mm. we've we've gone on and developed all of the bits of one of the three pillars of western esotericism into a bunch of different disciplines. Most people do not consider modern metallurgy part of chemistry, but they absolutely would recognize it as part of alchemy, you know. And then there's biochemistry, which is different. I don't know. From a magical perspective, they all fall under the umbrella of alchemy quite readily. Yeah. Um... He then said the poison path and the things Cochrane did with Belladonna are a whole other thing. Yeah. How, how did Cochrane die again, was it? With Belladonna. It was Belladonna, yeah. He, I'm going to go search that. He committed suicide uh, midsummer 1966 mm. um, with a Belladonna drought and wrote a letter saying he was of sound mind and that's what he was doing. So, but yeah, it's a whole other thing. And. The poison path is a whole other thing. I, From reading Cochrane's letters, and I am not a Cochranite, I am not part of any of the traditions that are handed down from him, so an outsider, but I don't think he was on the poison path. Mm -hmm. I don't think he was working those mysteries and doing that. I think he just had the, the general knowledge that kind of comes with most witchcraft about plants and their use in magic and, and those base things. And I mean, one of my, my points for why I don't think he was on the poison path is he talks about fly agaric and peyote here, not mugwort. You know, uh, so, but I could be wrong. I don't know. I don't think peyote is something you would find in the UK anyway. Mm, no. Another climate for it. Yeah. Fly agaric grows up there. Mm. But, I mean, by the 60s, perhaps they were readily available. I I don't know. I really don't. No, kind of said porn and witchcraft. They go well together. And uh, I must do OnlyFans. There you go. You um, want to do OnlyFans? Then... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to do it on YouTube. Um, he then asks, and he poisons some people at a hand faster. Oh, know. I haven't heard that. Tell mm -hmm. us that story. Yeah. Because I, well, I haven't start, heard that before. Yeah, you start typing and tell us the whole story. I'll read it just now, but I'll, I'll read the next paragraph on the letter. Okay. Do that. Um, then we come to the extremely puzzling line, I am a lure. The lure was more than a snare. I hate saying that word, lure. Lure. Lure? Lure. The lure. In America, we flip the R and the E. <laughs> Make it into a two-syllable word. <laughs> um, it was usually an imitation bird or animal used to attract the genuine article into a trap. Why is love a lure? Because it creates inspiration, and from inspiration comes the thirst for, for wisdom. The onset of physical love is also the onset of the two destructive creative forces in man. He can be fascinated by the object of his fancy, so that he will forget everything else. 
The stress of the love act produces poetry and in poetry is wisdom. Therefore, as we English say, a sprat to catch a mackerel. Something smaller to catch something bigger. The reason why the goddess of love in Britain was depicted as carrying a net was that she ensnares the, he the souls of her men with a devotion that very few women are able to command. In her love, this is, hard, this is a hard thing to say, there is death. And she rends her poets, lovers, apart before finally making them all wise. Grace follows this theme in The White Goddess, and there is always considerable truth in it. Be careful throughout your life of her traps. They will make you wise, but you will sing sweetly and sadly afterwards. She is fate, the creatoress and the destroyer. You will understand why she destroys, but the destruction will bring its own sorrow. As the goddess of love, she humbles us all at some time, and that sorrow is perhaps her greatest gift in the Moonstruck Poet. Right, yes. So, the only quibble I have in here is where he says... Uh, the goddess of love ensnares the souls of her men with a devotion that very few women are able to command. The confusion between love with a capital L and love between humans with a little l is dumb. Uh, sacred love, the devotion, the all-consuming love that happens in the oath, in the fiery poetic inspiration of divine madness, is not the same as physical love between people and should not be mm. it's it's not healthy um to treat and then expect another person to be a god that doesn't make sense and so that comparison i think happens frequently to the detriment of many people um but the the mm, link there he leans on the onset of physical love and the stress of the loved act. So he's obviously talking about sex and intercourse and orgasm produces mm. poetry and in poetry is wisdom. So this is obviously a Graves view of things, but the altered state of orgasm has long been used as a point of connection for divine madness and poetic inspiration in lots and lots of traditions. And hence that connection, and then in a purely heterosexual binary worldview, the overlay of the goddess of love and death onto an actual uh, human woman, things get all mixed up and in a mess, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so, but they they're not one and the same. Mm -hmm. And this um, also also goes along with. I don't know, all of the sexist stuff I find that, you know, only men can worship the goddess because it's this, for some reason, the goddess is so uh, simplified and binary as to be heterosexual and only call heterosexual men to her and that sort of thing. Oh, and just, oh yeah. I've never heard that. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh. I usually find that um, a lot of women carry on that men, men should not be doing witchcraft. Uh, I've heard that too. But that's not from mm. that, this idea that the goddess um, mm. of love and death calls and consumes her men and her priests. But I've also heard mm. that, you know, only women are witches stuff and men shouldn't do witchcraft and that whole pile of malarkey. Mm. See, this whole paragraph kind of just keeps reminding me of... Um... Eastern philosophies with the worship of the divine feminine and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, he then did say he made the ritual wine and the recipients didn't know. Mm. Mm. He put some poisonous plants in the cup. Yeah, yeah I not... thought it would be fun. Not very clever. And Candace said ignorance is bliss. Yeah, as someone who brews a love of, or a lot of ritual wine, as we're talking about love, off my tongue, 
a lot of ritual wines and incenses and teas and all sorts of stuff. I do a lot of herb stuff for a lot of people. I'm always very, very clear with people about what they're consuming. Mm -hmm. Always, always. And I talk to them about it. And I usually check if people are on medications because some things interact and won't be good. I mean, the most obvious for a lot of people is alcohol. You know, you don't give somebody alcohol if they can't have alcohol. Mm -hmm. But then there's also sugar. Somebody's diabetic. You don't give them sugar if they don't know it's there. You know, lots of that sort of thing. So to brew ritual wine and serve it to people and they don't know what's in it, that's not cool. Don't do that shit. No. As well as the 60s, though. So, you know, all of that. Well, there's... The drug culture started coming in at that stage. Unethical people in many ways. And I, I find that particular line of uh, violation and disrespect is, is amazingly common. Um, mm. I'm allergic to peppers, the whole pepper family, all the capsaicins. And when I go to restaurants sometimes, I will order something that can come as a hot, you know, super, super hot, spicy, and mild. And I always order the very mild or without sauce or something like that. And a lot of times the waiters will smirk or the chefs will go ahead and put the hot peppers on there because they think I'm just being a wuss or whatever. And it's like, no, I can't have it. It's not that I don't mm. like it. I love spicy stuff. I, I really enjoy spicy food. I just can't have that, you know? And there are times I've been on medications where I can't have alcohol, not even a mouthful. It would make me very, very ill, you know, and all sorts of other stuff. Everyone deserves the right to decide what goes in their body and to be informed about what goes in their body, you know, mm -hmm. and people get to make that choice, um, including the other way when you know someone shouldn't have alcohol and they decide they want to. You can talk to them about it, but ultimately it's their body. They get to decide what they want to do. Mm. So, yeah. I'm, kind of shit pisses me off. <laughs> yeah, he even said I love the goddess from the depths of my gay heart. Mm -hmm. cool. Yep, yep. I think being queer and how being queer factors into the entire worldview in witchcraft, especially these witchcrafts that are presented in this heterosexual binary and this monogamous binary, is something that we are finally beginning to explore in various witchcraft communities. And it is way long overdue, way long overdue, mm -hmm. because the world is not binary. People are not binary. It's not how things work. Plenty of us uh, queer folks are called to serve goddesses, are called to serve gods, are called to serve beings that don't show up in the binary. So, you know, yeah. Witchcraft mm -hmm. is queer. Uh, Candace said, I like the idea of brewing love. It makes the whole love potion a new meaning. Yeah. And consent matters. It does indeed. Yeah. Oh, well, I've definitely brewed love and brewed discord and brewed all sorts of things in the kitchen and the apothecary and the lab. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the exploring of LGBTQ plus in all areas is long overdue. Oh, uh, yeah, definitely is. But, well, because uh, each time we get good and into it, fascism rises and destroys all evidence thereof. Mm. So, yeah. Mm. And imperialism. All right. So. I am going to demand. So we take a break and get more hot chocolate because mine's <laughs> finished. This is going to be a long You're going to tonight, demand. Folks. Demand. Yes, demand. I am indeed. <laughs> we have wandered a bit. Long, long. Yes, we have. <laughs> but okay. it's fun. It's fun. It's fun and it's interesting. All right. So go and grab yourself some more hot chocolate. I am. And we'll see you just now. Be right back.
Welcome back to the Blackout Chat. And today we are discussing the fifth letter of the Cochrane letters to Joseph Wilson. And uh, we've got people getting coffee. You're supposed to get hot chocolate, people. You can drink whatever you want, as we just discussed. <laughs> Especially in your own home, where none of us are actually <laughs> physically there. <laughs> I can't have right, coffee. Okay, we are getting now into the next paragraph. <laughs> Hold your hand up. Time for you to stop talking. <laughs> I'm up. <laughs> All right. I am a hill is a reference to wisdom. Sin oh, wait, did I read this yeah. one already? No, I didn't. Yeah, that's where we are. Oh, is that where we are? Okay. I am a hill is a ref reference to wisdom since in vision you will see the castle of the seven gates or winds standing upon a gloomy hill turning four times to the elements the hill is life the steady climb with its triumphs and disasters to illumination or wisdom it is the dark tower that roland fell in fell in front of it is the castle dolor of the legend of the grail the care ochran of Predri and win, blah blah blah, etc. Pred Predui, Predui and win. Um, the adobe of the high goddess, the one in seven wisdom, the destroyer and creator of men. You will die many times to be reborn in this religion, and each little death is the resurrection of new hope and spirit. Whatever Madame Le Le Guidon, Guiden has in store, the law is that you will overcome, and in the overcoming find spiritual strength never be like i was for a short while arrogant in the knowledge of power for she soon tripped me up and brought me home across my black horse and i like the knights of old lie wounded and at this moment without hope all right madam uh, laguiden La is mentioned a lot in the white goddess apparently yeah I an article earlier the guiding lady. Mm. I mean, yeah, Graves mentions her quite frequently. I I think Graves uses her as a kenning for the white goddess, the overarching goddess. Mm. I don't know that. Um, it seems to give give her a lot of names. Though. Yeah, I mean that's one of the things that Graves is doing is syncretizing. Uh, putting mm. lots of different traditions together, lots of linking lots of different things, many of them that I don't think need to be linked. Um, but he also talks about poetic reinterpretation quite frequently, taking bits and pieces from history or um, images from history and reinterpreting them in light of Welsh mythology. Mm. So. And mm. I, I, I think it's all... This there you go. Sorry. Oh, I say I'm not a, I'm not a fan of syncretizing like that. I would much mm. rather have all of the context and go find out what it is, where it is. So. Yeah. Um, I think the main theme here is actually that um, you will die many times to be reborn in this religion, and each little death is the resurrection of new hope and spirit. Mm -hmm. and that's that's the little deaths that we go through; those periods where we kind of stop. And we have to take a step back and assess what's happened and everything else. Yeah. And we do. We go through them over and over again, the death and rebirth processes. Yeah. And one of Initiation. Our... Initiation and um, resurrection, rebirth, because uh, each each new rebirth is adds something. There is there is a Man, all the words are leaving. Benefit. There is a benefit to that process, even though um, I think calling it a death is appropriate. A lot of times we talk about it as the dark night of the soul or plateaus or, or that mm. sort of thing. But death is appropriate because it is a, a crumbling, a, a removing, and it's a stop. You know, we talk about the mystery of the cauldron is that it can never be still. It is the ever-turning cauldron of life. Death is 
not moving. It's a mm. lack of life, you know. So, yeah, I, I think I kind of chuckled. Uh, the hill is life and it's steady climb. And it made me think, you know, the common phrase, there are many paths up the mountain. I'm just like, well, that comes from Buddhist philosophy, you know, that grew up in a place where there are mountains. And this comes from a place where there are hills. <laughs> <laughs> But you still gotta climb. <laughs> <laughs> um, heathen said, "Oh my word! I've got a word here I can't pronounce." Mythopoesis. Mythopoesis. Would it be? Yeah, I, I don't know. I I like mythopoesis and mythopoetic understanding, but I don't think Graves does it well. I think he does syncretism in the pursuit of what could be um, well contextualized mythopoetic understanding and inspiration. Um, uh, the Pharmacognosis series by Dale Pendle. Oh man, I don't know if that's right. Let me Google that very quickly. Um, he does mythopoesis very, very well. Uh, and so does, yeah, Dale Pendle. Wow. Okay, I got that right. But his his book series is a good study in that process. Of course, that's from uh, herbal uh, guild kind of perspective. Um, but that that process is, I think, what Graves was reaching for. But my personal opinion is he fell short. Mm -hmm. um, he even said that the death at the crossroads is so much more than the dark night of the soul true but i don't know mm. that um cochran is here talking about the death at the crossroads at least that's not what i interpreted because he's mm. talking about the steady climb with its triumphs and disasters to illumination and wisdom or wisdom and the castle delore the dark tower kyr alcran the uh, upward climb to the path of union with the divine. So, I took yeah, that. It's not progression. Even though he's using death here, and death and rebirth is the, the language. At least. Where is that that death and rebirth and the initiation as you, sort of climb upwards? Yeah. Keep going through those deaths and rebirths, and progress, growth. Um, kind of said the house on the hill is also a very well used literary tool, usually used when the main character is looking for information and knowledge. It's my interpretation is that each death is based on the new knowledge learnt for belladonna, belladonna, belladonna use. Yeah, but the house, the house on the hill though, doesn't doesn't that come? The literary tool, anyway, doesn't that come from the dolmens um, being the entrance into the underworld, being sort of a considered a house almost? I don't know. I was going to say the the question is why is it a literary tool and why is it very well used, um, especially in English literature and Welsh literature, and that is one thing about Robert Graves and Cochrane's works here that we've been studying and looking at, they're very narrowly focused on this, this small area of culture and mythology, and um, it's had a, a great influence. But yeah, why is it a common literary tool? When did it come about? Um, when did it start being used as a literary device because things don't enter as literary devices unless they have understanding and cultural impact that the author can draw on to communicate something else so that had to have an existing cultural impact or it wouldn't have made any sense in the literature of the time people would not have understood it and what audience were they writing for because there was a time when literature was only written for certain classes it was not expected that the 
peasant class necessarily would be literate in order to understand it. So it was targeted at perhaps a priestly class or an upper class, and those kinds of cultural connections within there were different in different classes. So I think there's probably some interesting bits in that background, why it is culturally significant and where that came from. And then got to go further back than that, because I'm sure that point is somewhere post-conversion and figure out what was going on in pagan contexts that led to that development, because we find a lot of those uh, pagan roots in later times, because as we've talked about before, as Christianity moved across and, and conquered people, they absorbed and adapted instead of changing in many places. Mm. So I somehow remember um, something about the house on the hill being a reinterpretation of the house in the hill. Mm. I'll figure out where I, or, well, where I remember that from. Though. Yeah. Actually, the, the the next paragraph might get into it a bit more. Oh, true. We should um, read before Candace, we talk. You know, Candace did said to say, um, I am also sure it is a psychological tool. So please check references. Okay. All right. So let's read this next one. It all goes, also goes on about the hill. So um, anciently, the castle upon the hill is a very common motive in folk art. You will find many specimens of this in traditional Romany caravans, in that the inner walls are painted with roses, red and white, a roadway with 19 trees line, lining it, and a castle at the end of the road upon a high hill. Armorial and coats of arms are also good examples, and about a 150 mile trot from here, a trot, um, there, <laughs> there is an old inn that has, sorry, I'm getting lots of imagery, weird imagery in my head. Um, there is an old inn that has, as a sign, a castle founded upon three silver spheres. In Kabbalism, Kabbalism, um, the sphere becomes the moon and is known in Hebrew as Yesod, or foundation. Uh, now, the three moons represent inspiration or spirit in these aspects, life, the virgin, love, the mother, and death, wisdom, the hag. As such, then, the hill is representative of the three major sources of inspiration and fate in physical life. The problems that we face are based upon these three foundations. Gray writes, they are the poetic theme, but they are the structure of existence before that. You know, nah. Nah. <laughs> yeah. So I just read 150 mile trot. <laughs> right. And then there's an old inn. I mean, when you give directions in England, you turn right at the, at the at, at that pub and turn left at that pub and right. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm sure there's lots of coats of arms and that sort of thing that have. cryptic symbolism that could be mystical in origin or could just be cryptic and therefore sounds mystical. The bringing mm -hmm. in the Kabbalah, that's super weird. Yeah. Um, sphere becomes because the moon. The Sephira um, are spheres. I mean, that's where we get the word sphere, but it's not just the moon and it's not only Yassad. Um, So that seems strange um well you, you sort of is related to the moon and i don't know if that aspect. that is the reason he links the castle founded on three silver spheres to the triple moon idea of the goddess i it seems a, a tenuous link since that doesn't make much sense i i wouldn't think you'd even need a reference to Kabbalah and a single Sephiroth in there. Um, well, I'm, I'm actually just trying to figure out if he's equating the three moons, which are life, love, mother, and death, wisdom. I'm oh, sorry, life, love, and death, with the sign 
of a castle founded upon three silver spheres, which is the sign for the old inn. I think he is, and using the sphere Maybe. becomes the moon you saw it, and there is the link, which doesn't really make sense. But the old inn could have just thought the image was nice. Right. I mean, <laughs> it's a pub sign. Yeah. Um, but that's part of that yeah. that poetic vision, being able to see the magical and the mundane. And the problem with that is it doesn't translate. <laughs> you get you mm. have this wonderful epiphany experience, and you tell somebody else about it, and they're like, "It's a pub sign." You know, <laughs> okay, sure. Yep. Um, that Answer doesn't eleven eleven. <laughs> yeah, it My doesn't mean eleven eleven. What does it mean? Yeah. But it's eleven minutes past eleven. Yeah. You can have a mystical experience like that, um, that when somebody else looks at it, it's terribly mundane and doesn't translate over. It, they're just not, they're not transitive at all. Mm. Um, Candace said, from a military perspective, the house on the hill would also be an, at an advantage because of the higher ground. Um, I do don't know if it was real or not, but the ca a lot of castles were built on hills because of this, for the same reason. Yeah, but I don't know what that would... advantage point. Plus the, the enemy running up the hill gets exhausted before they get to the gate. <laughs> All that makes me think of is Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Probably comes from there, yeah. <laughs> I've got to watch Monty Python again. The only way I can relate that to, to a mystery. Military mm. strategy into to magic. But anyways. Yeah. And Spicy Hobbit is here. Yay! Hi, Mandy. Hello, Spicy Hobbit. And Candace is here all week. Thank you very much. Very much appreciate that. Tip your waitress. Right. <laughs> so I I don't know about the a common. I don't know how he gets this out of Romani caravans and calling them folk art first. Uh the roadway with 19 trees and a castle at the end of the road upon a high hill what would that have to do with the welsh english mythology that graves is talking about that's not yeah, maybe he's just doing the graves thing and linking a load of difference maybe so and it, that might be in graves <laughs> i'm i'm trying to plow through it but oh my word it just i have to it takes a while because I have to throw the book across the room and rant and rave for an hour and a half about what I just read. And then the next paragraph, and it just is a slog. <laughs> mm, that is. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, uh, I think we, had, we decided to torture people if they ever got involved. Yeah. No, no, we're not torturing people. Wait, don't take that out of context. No. <laughs> I don't know, it could be. <laughs> All right, next one. I am a sow, I or I am a boar. Uh, this refers to Keridwin, the greedy sow who in Celtic poetry eats her own pharaoh. The nightmare fertility and death in one creature and so we come to the end of the pentagram the principle of fate giving birth to life then for reasons of her own destroying her own litter a fact that any pig farmer will tell you about okay so apparently he was going through the five points of the pentagram with those okay. uh, not just pigs continue not not just pigs, no. Yeah. Yeah, let's continue. Yeah, not much in there. Uh, as you have realized, the poetry of the ancients was based upon observed natural fact. From the lesser phenomena of nature, they drew conclusions about greater and spiritual phenomena, reflecting, as I do, that there is nothing created, but it has a symbolic link with spiritual principles. I am not saying that physical creation has what the theosophists like to call a purpose that is something different but in creation one uses a greater force to create the lesser and there is an indivisible link between all things and their spiritual counterparts as you say the gods are in man and man is in the gods 
Yeah, Candace said rodents too. Yep. Yeah. There's lots of them. Well, lots of animals. Mm. No, carry on. I, I'm rereading here. I I don't even know what that says, other than like stuff is linked. Mm. Not really there. Sorry, it... I trimmed my beard today and I think I forgot to trim the hair yeah, because it keeps tickling my nose. <clears throat> okay. I guess carry on. I, that. Not much to discuss okay. there. Yeah. All right, then. Uh, you will also find contained within my letters to you a ritual, which is the basic ritual of the faith, that of the cauldron. Is this referring to what we saw last week? That um, the symbols at the end of the letter. Should we just Perhaps. pull that up quickly? Perhaps, uh, let's see here. Let me switch here for a second so I can duplicate this without making the screen do weird things. So here we go. Uh, Ken just said for me it was it was just how the micro scales emulates the macro scale and vice versa. Yeah. Yeah, the whole that's, God is in man and man is in the gods. That's it's the microcosm, macrocosm. What I took it as and and not much more for as many words were there. So here mm. is the this month's problem from last week's letter. We have the three uh crescent moons together equals the moon and then the uh, crossroads where X marks a spot with the little terminators and then a question mark which we couldn't decide if it was that's the question or if that's part of the equation mm. so and this might not even be referring to that but at least we got it now so we can remember it have a look at it while I'm reading it so now. let's see um, um, let me get back to where we were there we go you will also find contained within my letters to you a ritual which is the basic ritual of the faith, that of the cauldron. You know now how to approach an altar, how to create an altar, how to create the sacrament, hoozle, bread and wine, and what to expect from it. You have in your possession the broom. Later we will speak of the sword and stone, which is to do with fire. But now you are girded and can administer the water of life to your family if you so desire remember though that male and female work together and where the male intellect of fire gutters and burns out the female water will wear at the problem gently until it is reshaped and understood in the final analysis rely upon what a woman feels rather than upon what you think is right of air and earth, we have those between us. Okay. Uh, Richard said, triple moon and crossroads makes me think of Hecate. Yeah. But I don't think Cochrane worked with Hecate. Or Hecate. No, um, might be a reference to the goddess, though. No, oh, true. Yeah. I think this was... Uh, more all goddesses or one goddess kind of thought at the time. Mm. All right, so this is really getting at men burn out quickly and women can mark a path through the rocks with their water aspects. I don't know. Everybody's got everything. Everyone has access to all sorts of energies and all sorts of elements. And, and here's another thing I have a problem with when we talk about masculine and feminine elements. People automatically relate them to male and female genders and roles. Mm. And th those aren't the same. We are, we are not using those terms in the same way at all. So, you know, if you are a, a man who is happy being a man, that doesn't mean you don't have access to all of the feminine elements and all of the feminine qualities and 
feminine types of magic, especially in this case. Now, you probably don't have access to the female mysteries, but they're mysteries. They're not mm -hmm. easily accessible, but especially very, very basic building blocks of a lot of magic like the elements, I don't think should be divided amongst the sexes as available and not available. Um, because we know plenty of people who um, will have an affinity for one element or the other, and rarely is it perfectly tied to their genitalia. That's just mm. not the way it works. So um, we're, when he's talking about the male intellect or fire, we're using male to mean active and consuming. Fire is transforming and consuming, and so is the intellect. The intellect takes things in and consumes them and transforms them into something else. It is an ever-devouring force. And water will wear away at the problem gently. So even though water is listed here as feminine, it is not being shown as receptive in opposition to a masculine or active intellect. It's being shown as something with a longer time period, something that is slower, but yet more persistent. Fire is quick, and once it consumes its fuel, it's done. Fire can only exist in the presence of fuel and oxygen, um, which it always gets. Air is required for fire. But the water slowly erodes over time. It does not need fuel. It is in of itself a, a changing and a transforming force. So I would suggest let's leave the male and female stuff out of there. And, you know, somebody who has um, understood the persistence of slowly working through a problem probably has a better gut instinct because it is developed through that persistence over time. But that doesn't have to do with plumbing. Uh, not plumbing. I mean, in the, uh, throughout this whole process, I mean, these related water to the goddess and fire to the god. Mm -hmm. um, now he's just bringing in terms like male and female instead of god and goddess, I think. Well, yeah. But he, he's quite clearly um, relating it to man and woman as practitioners of the craft. And mm -hmm. I think that's a mistake, but it's something I see again and again in a variety of forms of witchcraft. And mm -hmm. I, I also see the damage that it does to people again and again. People who are excluded from possibilities in magic. People who cannot relate to the terms and the way that magic is being taught. That they cannot find themselves in the mythology, which is extremely important. And... Mm -hmm. You know, it continues the limitation of these narrowly defined binary gender roles that really are not part of a vast majority of human history and definitely are not part of a vast majority of the cultures that have birthed modern witchcrafts. So um, I know uh, everybody's probably tired of hearing me say it and go on about it, but it's just everywhere. It's insidious. And if we're going to address it and be able to work the mysteries in a way that is accessible to everyone, we have to pay attention to those things. We have to find that way through. And what good is witchcraft if it is not accessible to those that need it? Mm. Yeah. I mean, I, have, I actually have, personally have a close relationship with water and fire because of my healing. I just find water is vital to the whole process. So, mm -hmm. You know, I can't equate to what's being said there, personally. Well, and really, <clears throat> I think if you're going to be a, a competent witch, you need to be familiar and proficient with all of the tools that you can yeah. be. And that... Yeah, I mean, there are times when you need to bring certain things to the surface in order to deal with whatever it is. And, and, you know, that means being comfortable with your feminine side and your masculine side and, and queerness and all of that stuff in there. Um, mm -hmm. It all comes up at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Completely agree. Now, Candace gave us a very profound statement. Duh. 
<laughs> and said witchcraft is queer, as you said earlier. Yes, it is. All right. Let's go on to the next paragraph then. Everybody seems to have quietened down now in the chat. Well, or like or like or all the excitement. We were ranting on about Jesus and weird things and. <laughs> 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 all right um please do not please do not thank me for helping you you also help me to describe the faith is like teaching but if you teach then eventually the pupil must turn on the on the teacher since wisdom is only found in freedom and teacher and pupil and teacher and pupil alike are not truly free since the teacher is bound by dogma in order to explain and therefore foregoes inspiration. The pupil has to follow the dogma in order to understand the teacher. Wisdom is not dogmatic, and when the pupil becomes wise, he must necessarily break from the teacher and interpret dogma and the promptings of his soul as he sees fit. Therefore, I explain to you what I know but I am not teaching you. You are taking from it what you require and transmuting these ideas to your own needs. I do think that's a brilliant explanation of teaching. Well, he basically just said the system of teaching fails, but we still have to do it. I would say if mm. it's not producing what you want, change it. But also that um, describe, describing the faith is like teaching. Right? No? What am I talking about here? I don't know. I was thinking that you, when you teach, you actually learn yourself. Because, oh, absolutely. Yeah. There is no better way to get your head in a subject than try to explain it to somebody else. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, teaching is teaching is the best way to learn something, which sounds ridiculous, uh, but it's in the preparation. I, I don't mean stand up in front of people and bullshit for a while you have to do the preparation. You have to really, truly understand something inside and out to be able to turn around and explain it to somebody, especially in a dialogue, because the, the best way to learn something is to be questioned on something you don't know. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we find we learn a lot of things and then we have narrowed our viewpoint. We stop considering all those other things because our foundation of knowledge has led us down this path. So it's always wonderful to have conversation with people who are not in that field, who are not uh, down that path, because they will ask questions you never thought of. And you get to learn more and more about whatever it is you're interested in through that questioning process, which is part of the reason we do this show the way we do. Mm. You know, to have those opportunities to talk to people, um, to have people ask questions. I don't know how many private quiet messages I get from people that are always like I have a question but I'm not sure if I should ask it in this forum or if I could ask it you know anywhere else because I might get laughed at and every time I hear that my heart breaks no, no. because what is more sacred than the question of someone who is learning mm. really that is the the fuel for the fire that that drives the light of the craft for everyone and if we stop feeding the fire of the craft it dies mm. so we can't we can't stop questioning and we absolutely as a community must stop making fun of people for asking genuine questions it is ridiculous it is the the gatekeeping that leads leads to death you know there are no stupid questions. There are absolutely people that ask questions in bad faith. Those I, I don't appreciate. But mm. genuine questions asked in good faith are what helps everyone in the process. And sometimes it's a really common question that everybody asks, you know? Mm. And sometimes it's, it's a totally different viewpoint. But... I firmly believe the only way to actually pursue witchcraft is to ask questions. No matter what kind of witchcraft we're talking about, Cochrane's work, Gardner's work, um, Chumbly, 
anybody, any of the many, many streams of witchcraft, traditional or not, you got to ask questions and you have to, you have to go down it. But I don't know about the, the pupil must turn on the teacher. I mean, you can't learn from one single person your whole life. You got to, you got to learn from lots of different sources. But I, that the pupil must turn on the teacher since wisdom is only found in freedom, implying that the teacher is limiting the freedom of the student or the pupil well, is the term here. That's usually that the pupil exceeds the teacher. Well, so yeah. The pupil gets to a point where they become more knowledgeable than the teacher themselves. Isn't that the hope of every teacher? Yeah, <laughs> That's... it is. Why? So I'm, I'm not sure if he was just using wrong terms here. But... I, I don't know. Yeah. I also don't think there's dogma in the craft. Why would there be? Yeah, and you just say here, and teacher and pupil alike are not truly free, since the teacher is bound by dogma. I mean... And the four foregoes inspiration. Am I, am I misunderstanding no. the meaning of dogma here? It's almost like he's saying the teacher has to teach a particular thing in a particular way to the pupil. And the pupil needs to follow that particular thing until they get to the point where they are free of it. And then they can take it and they can become free. But it doesn't really make sense, actually. Yeah, well, no, sorry, I'll take my statement back earlier. It's not a very good paragraph. Dogma is something that authority says is true. And you can't question it because it's just, it's true. There's but no authority in the craft. And there's nothing that no. is that great capital truth in the craft either so how could we have dogma but something we, we we keep saying over and over again is that when somebody comes onto a particular path they should learn that path mm. to its fullest right and not go outside the boundaries of that path until they know it and then they can go outside of the boundaries of that um that's that's the impression i get from this but he's just gone a bit further with the explanation and, and trying to contain it a bit more which yeah, perhaps. No, I, I don't really understand. And, and you know that that focus on what you're learning thing, I don't just think applies to magic or witchcraft or different traditions or mm. paths. I mean, you do that when you go to college. You focus upon, you know, your field of study. You don't just go all over everywhere and take bits and pieces. You are welcome mm. to do that in your post-grad work because you've focused on that field and learn the mm. whole ball of wax. You got to swim around the entire pool before you get out and see what the water's like next door. Yeah. Um, sorry, Mitch, go over here. Candace said coffee is wearing off. <laughs> Damn, you better get more. Um, it's how I passed my degree. Uh, I think that was a reference to something I was saying earlier. About uh, teaching is the best way to learn. Questioning. Yes, yeah. Oh, yeah, because Richard, Richard said the best way to learn is teaching it. That is what I tell my students. Mm -hmm. um, Candace asked, aren't, aren't common questions indicative of needs that aren't addressed in understanding? Well, um, that would be true in a revealed tradition. But in a mystery tradition like witchcraft, you're expected to question. And in fact, coming to the point where you can question certain things is the process. So if everybody's asking these questions, then the process is working. Um, I mean, sometimes it, it absolutely can be needs that aren't being addressed, uh, failure in the system, but in a mystery tradition, and definitely with the riddles that are present in Cochrane-influenced witchcraft and a lot of other traditional witchcraft, it's really important to ask questions because the answers are not handed to you. We don't just tell you what they are. You're supposed to figure it out on your own. You're supposed to put two and two together and, and have that process. And that process is not answering the riddles all the time. Sometimes mm. it's asking the questions. Um, Candace also said, so in psychology, you change psychologists when you have gained everything you can learn, you, you can learn from them. Um, it is not the same 
is it not the same? Uh, you leave a teacher once you feel you have learned everything you can from them. No, I don't no. feel it's the same at all because um, uh, of the Dunning-Kruger Mount Stupid effect. Uh, when you think you know everything, you really don't know much of anything. And so mm. if you make that choice to leave when you think you know everything, you are losing the opportunity to learn more. And I, I just think that's a terrible way to approach learning in general. Um, to learn from many teachers is good. You may study intensely with a teacher for a time and then move on to study intensely with another teacher, but that doesn't mean you leave the previous teacher. And it, mm. it definitely doesn't mean that you've learned everything. Because once you study an area intensely to the point that you have examined all seven directions and have, you know, a good grasp of the foundation of the worldview and you move on to something else, when you learn the next worldview, you will naturally compare and contrast. And then you will need to go back to the first one to learn all the things you couldn't see without the comparison and then once you got two it's time for a third one and now the perspective is as tripart instead of just binary and then it's time for a fourth one and so on and so forth if you leave those teachers every time you're never going to actually build a dimensional understanding it will just be a b c in a linear format Mm. Rule one of witchcraft, question everything, absolutely. No, rule one of witchcraft is don't leave open flames unattended. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then you might have the question, why did the house burn down? But yeah, it's still a question, it's still a question. <laughs> and Richard said, Dunning-Kruger effect, I, I agree completely. I, you know, the paradigm here is one where uh, teacher and student are not in a hierarchy. It, it's power through, not power over. Mm. You know, um, like we just said, you learn so much from students when you are in the position of teaching, just like students learn from teachers. It's a mutual endeavor. And it should always be remembered that it is power through, not power over. Um, absolutely run screaming down the block if some teacher is like, I'm the teacher and I'm in charge and da 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 again and again and again. That's not effective teaching. That's not beneficial for anybody. It's That's not what it's about. Now, I, I've absolutely had classes where I've had to be the person that says, stop talking about Jesus. Let's get back to the letter. <laughs> like Lee has done, because shit happens. <laughs> We're all squirrely. <laughs> but, you know, that's not, that's not power over. You stop banging the table. Right. <laughs> that's partnership. And that's partnership to guide back to the topic we're supposed to be studying, to explore things together. So why would you leave that possibility of connection and learning when you think you've learned everything? It just doesn't doesn't make sense. And this is why we keep going back to basics as well, because every time we go back to basics, we take new knowledge with us and we learn new things from those very basic things. Mm -hmm. And so you keep going back to that first teacher, that those all those foundations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm. And it's so important to go back over stuff, to go back to basics, to go review the the foundational stuff and and. I'm amazed at how many people balk at it. Oh, it's just, you know, beginner stuff. Well, yeah, it's foundation. Yeah, it's the base of things. Um, you probably mm -hmm. forgot some things. You have a new perspective now. You can see some new things. And uh, especially if you had a point where you plateaued or you stopped practicing or whatever, probably need to brush up on some skills. We could all use that in our work. You know, mm -hmm. we all have... Uh, daily mundane life interfere with our great plans for ritual magic and have to go back and brush up on stuff. 
All right, shall I finish off? Because there's not, mm -hmm. nothing here, actually. Uh, the buckle in the photograph is a spouted pot used for pouring the water of life. You will find all the physical paraphernalia, ritual in it, and much of the symbolic symbolical stuff also. No idea what he's talking about. We don't know what the yeah, photograph is. Yeah, we don't know what the photograph is, so... No. If you wish, I will do a complete reading upon your immediate future, or for that matter, upon your complete future. It is easily done. My best wishes to Daisy, yourself, and the children. I sense that it will be a girl, and I got an impression that she will be fair-headed. She, if I am right, will live long and happily, and also be wealthy by marriage to a man that she will love. There you go. We have no idea what else is about, but anyway. Yeah, yeah, personal stuff. Um, mm. But such a classic <laughs> uh, reading, right? Mm. Such a classic reading, a fair-headed child and she will wed well oh, for, yeah. for wealth and mm. love and live long and happy. I mean, how many oh, um, expectant parents would you like to date? Well, um, the cards say the child will be terribly ugly and have a very very hard life probably some abuse you just <laughs> no I'm not gonna not... tell anybody that no not how those <laughs> things go <laughs> and yeah. frankly i've never seen anything like that in readings and mm. so it's not not how you the see, you wouldn't see a fair-headed child not how the potentiality of a newborn person works in my experience mm. so yeah because i mean our future changes all the time anyway so mm -hmm. Mm. all right that brings us to the end of the fifth letter and there are no more questions in the chat Just... so i think we will wrap it up Watch. Checking our um, schedule here. Looks like we're going to do the sixth letter next week, and then we will have a show about the equinoxes on yeah. the 18th. So we will okay. do one more, finish up Joe Wilson's letters, and then we'll take a break and talk about some other things. Before we get into the next bunch. Mm -hmm. uh, Lady Capera said, mutable future. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, Richard, Im imagine keeping friends by telling them their offspring will look hideous. Uh, <laughs> I don't think people yeah. will stick around. <laughs> no, no, not the way that works. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. So we will be doing the sixth letter next week, and then we'll do some other stuff. There we go. Thank you everyone so for being here today and actively talking in the chat. This was highly enjoyable to engage with all of you in our, our serious study and our goofy flights of fancy. That's what makes yes. study time fun, right? And, and our Jesus talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, it's not finished baking, <laughs> put it back in the oven. <laughs> all parents think their children are beautiful. Of course. Yeah. All babies yeah. are beautiful. Yeah. I'm still beautiful, so it's okay. All right, then. Thanks for being here. Hope to see you next week. Have a good one. Good night. Good evening. Good afternoon. And good morning. Ta-ra. Bye-bye. <laughs>